Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Kathleen has started us off. Awesome. Um, she is tuning in, uh, connecting with us right here in Minneapolis. Um, we just love to know who's in the community today. Um, Katie will give an excellent presentation, but it's always helpful when you're presenting for the webinar formats, you don't get to see your audience. So it's nice to know that she can know um, who's here and maybe what disciplines you're coming from um, sharing with us today. Um, as these events for Wayside are not just events, we believe we're connecting a community of practitioners, educators, providers, community members um, together to address the disparities in maternal and infant health. Um, so I am going to begin, it is 12.03. I'd like to welcome everyone um, to the Wayside Maternal and Infant Health Series. My name is Nicole Fernandez. I am the project manager and community liaison for this project. And for those of you who may not be familiar with Wayside Recovery Center, um, we have been in business for over 65 years. Uh, we seek to improve and support the lives of over 32,000 women and, and 6,100 children in Minnesota by, who have been impacted by trauma and addiction. Um, Wayside believes in, in a holistic um, approach to care. Um, trying to support mothers and children. And I believe we're one in six in the nation who allow um, moms to bring their children to a therapy. Um, why is Wayside, right, even in this conversation? Um, our recovery center understands that the maternal and infant health mortality crisis cannot be adequately addressed without understanding dismantling racism, bias, and our medical and behavioral health systems. We also understand that the complexities of this crisis, you know, require community-based responses. This means not only addressing the stigma associated with substance use disorders or mental illness, but also recognizing the inequities that persist across the behavioral health systems. So we feel that we wanna be in partnership, right? To serve women and families the best way that we can um, in addressing some of these healthcare gaps. And we believe providing this educational series is a way to kind of address that. Um, support to improve outcomes um, and to support families. And so with the support of the Minnesota Department uh, of Human Services, DHS, Wayside is hosting these free public, a public education echo training sessions in this series format that is fostering collaboration between patients, community, health practitioners, educators, and so many more to deliver a higher quality of care, um, particularly for Black mothers and infants, but all mothers and birthing people. Um, the other thing I would like to just make sure that I also share in terms of the funding, um, that these sessions are fully funded through the State Opioid Response Grant from the Sam Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, and the Minnesota Department of Human Services, um, and nothing in the materials constitutes a direct or indirect endorsement by SAMHSA or the Minnesota Department of DHS of content, services, and or policies. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker today, which is Katie Stone. And the topic she will be sharing with us today is helping children thrive, addressing health disparities, and fostering social emotional development among youth in foster care. Katie, just to share a little bit about her, I think she's phenomenal. Um, I believe we came fast friends, um, just even trying to discuss what, what could she bring with her expertise and experience. And so Katie, it, Katie Stone is a postdoctoral fellow in the Division of Clinical Behavior and Neuroscience at the University of Minnesota Medical School. She graduated from the University of Kansas with a PhD in clinical child psychology. Her clinical and research areas of expertise are in early childhood mental health and impact of childhood trauma exposure across the developmental lifespan. Her program of research is centered on understanding pathways of risk and resilience, underlying adjustment outcomes for adversity exposed youth. In line with a systems-based approach, she examines individual, 
and environmental factors, for example, coping, family environment, emotion regulation that contributes to youth functioning. I also want to share that Katie will provide her presentation and then we should have about maybe five um, to 10 minutes um, for Q&A questions. You will share those questions in the uh, Q&A and or chat. And my counterpart today, my on my team is Ms. Zora Darkot, and she'll be helping me facilitate this conversation today. Without further ado, we look forward to hearing from you, Katie Stone. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that introduction, Nicole. Um, I just checked the Q&A and it looks like maybe the chat function is disabled. So I don't know if you guys can work that on the back end as I get started. I think that was part of the reason we weren't able to kind of see where people are coming from and what they're doing. But um, hopefully we get that fixed here in a few minutes. Uh, but thank you for that introduction. I'm so excited that you joined me for the noon hour. Uh, today to talk about a topic that is so near and dear to my heart, working with families um, that have been exposed to adversities and then subsequently kids that have been placed into foster care and how do we help support these families and children. Um, my talk starts out by saying helping children thrive, but really I hope you see from the things that we talk about today, it's really helping families thrive, helping parents and children thrive as we address these disparities and help them to develop really high quality social emotional skills to, to support them for the lifelong. Um, before I get into all of the content, I wanna just uh, make sure that you know that I have no financial uh, comfort, conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, a lot of the information I'm gonna share with you is work that I've done clinically um, and then research that we know from the field. Um, and I want this to be as collaborative as possible. I want you to feel comfortable asking questions. Um, I know we don't have, I'm not able to see you all, but um, if as much as we can share your thoughts and opinions and questions throughout, and I'll do my best to kind of track that as we uh, go through. And then certainly we'll have some time at the end to uh, answer any questions and things like that as they come up, um, if we can't do it throughout. Uh, but, you know, it's consistent with the learning objectives for today. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the plan for today. The agenda for today is to really address uh, some of those health disparities within child welfare, um, specific to mental health, but other health disparities as well. Um, and then talk about some of the consequences of early adversity, both prenatally and postnatally and how it impacts children's neurodevelopmental functioning. And then really focusing on, hopefully you find some really helpful strategies as you're working with families and kids within your communities or your own children um, to promote social emotional development in children, despite some of the adversities they may have experienced. So we'll get started, but I, you know, I wanted to start out with a case example. I think sometimes in these presentations, we get so caught up in the details and the research and it's hard to keep everything straight. Um, and then we leave and we're, we leave these presentations and we're like, what did I learn? Like, what did I get from that? Um, and sometimes it's helpful to really ground yourself in um, a case or a family or a child that like is close to your heart that you've worked with, um, or even an example that I'm going to share with you today. So I, I'm going to share um, a little bit about a, a young boy named Dylan, which uh, is not his real name, but um, a little boy named Dylan that I have worked with clinically. Um, and I hope that from this information, you'll be able to kind of have a picture in your mind, either of Dylan and his experience or um, another family that you've worked with or another child that you've worked with. So you can kind of use that as this grounding framework as we're kind of talking through some of the details and the research and all of that. Um, and so just a little bit about me. So I am a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Minnesota Med School. Um, more specifically, I work in the birth to three clinic uh, at the University of Minnesota and the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain. So we see really young children and families. Um, we see young children with birth parents as well as foster parents. Um, we work with caseworkers often. 
And really what we try to do is offer an evidence-based assessment approach to get a sense of kind of what is this child experienced? Uh, what are the presenting concerns? Uh, are there any recommendations we can provide? And then we do have some intervention services within our birth to three, um, but because we know there's so many wonderful community partners, we also refer out. Um, and then in addition to our birth to three clinic, I'm also a fellow in the adoption medicine clinic. Um, so a lot of the work I do is also with kids who've been internationally adopted, uh, domestically adopted, and then um, are in foster care currently. And um, through that work, we're able to take a really multidisciplinary approach. We have an MD and an occupational therapist and a psychology team. Um, and we work with kids in, in foster care to try to pro provide this holistic approach to understanding the child and their family. Um, and so that's where this case is coming from, that, those clinical experiences. Um, and so... I wanted to share a little bit about Dylan. Um, so he came to our clinic, our birth to three clinic and our adoption medicine, but this is um, a kiddo that we uh, did a full evaluation on and I'll kind of get into some of those specifics later. But I just wanted to uh, start with some demographics and a little bit about his history. So you could kind of keep that in mind as um, we're moving forward through the presentation. So he is a two-year-old biracial male. He, um, his race and ethnicity are white to Native American. Um, his history is also complicated by both prenatal uh, exposures as well as postnatal risk factors and some medical complexity. So prenatally, we know he had confirmed exposure to alcohol, uh, methadone, as well as uh, tobacco. And then uh, postnatally, he uh, parents had substance abuse uh, challenges, and um, and so and then they were also engaged in some domestic violence that uh, him and his brothers were exposed to, um, and then some physical neglect. And some of those uh, postnatal experiences did lead to him being placed into foster care. Um, and so he had a caregiver disruption is kind of what we call it um, at 17 months. So really critical period of, of development for him. Um, and he was placed with kinship providers. So he was placed with his paternal uh, aunt at that time. And um, some of his medical complexity involves, he did have a NICU stay for neonatal abstinence syndrome, um, as well as uh, epilepsy. Um, I think his most recent seizure was in uh, January, 2020. And so it is more um, regulated now. He hasn't had as many seizures due to medications and being able to detect that epilepsy early. Um, he also has some congenital heart problems that is managed through his cardiac team. Um, and then finally, the presenting concerns that they brought to us in clinic had a lot to do with just like high energy level, impulse control, um, a, a lot of hyperactivity, uh, but then also low frustration tolerance and, and some of some aggression towards others um, and even towards himself. So hitting himself in the head when he's really frustrated, things like that. Um, and then some pretty significant developmental delays. So at 17 months, he was um, starting to, he still wasn't talking at that time. He didn't know his own name. So he wasn't responding to his name. Um, he also had some motor delays. Um, he had teeth rot and then and he had not started eating solid foods at 17 months. He was still using a bottle for food um, or for his um, nutrients. So a little bit about Dylan. Um, so I want you to kind of keep, like I said, keep that in mind as we kind of move through the presentation. So in order to, you know, a lot of what we're going to talk about is, um, might sound familiar, but I want to just make sure that we're all on the same page and I'll breeze through some of this um, as we go forward, because I think a lot of people already have some familiarity with what adverse childhood experiences are. Um, so again, I'm just going to breeze through some of this. Um, but basically, it's uh, research that was has been done by Folletti um, and team um, at Kaiser Permanente. And really what they found is that 
parents or adults, I should say, retrospective reports show that early experiences of adversity have lifelong consequences. And they identified some of these um, adversities into a few different categories. So some that you're likely familiar with. So different types of abuse, like physical, emotional, and sexual, um, different types of neglect, and then other types of challenges for children. So um, uh, someone in the home, like a parent with mental illness, a household member that has all uh, been incarcerated, um, exposure to domestic violence or um, parental substance use within the home. Um, so if we're thinking about our, our friend Dylan that I just shared with you, we already know that he has a, a, a number of these different cases. So he has some experience of physical neglect, um, likely some emotional neglect too, although that's so hard to measure and know really, but um, definitely physical neglect that was that was observed. Um, we do know there was some domestic violence present. We know that there was parental substance use of, use of both caregivers um, and likely that involved a, a, some mental illness as well. So um, on average, he likely had a, around, around five confirmed ACEs when he was placed into foster care at 17 months. And so for those kiddos that have experiences of adversity that raise to the level of severe concern, oftentimes child welfare becomes involved. And this, uh, this uh, language comes from the CAPTA, which is the federal legislation, as a definition for what is the, the definition of child abuse and neglect. So any failure on the part of the caregiver um, that results in death, serious or physical emotional harm, sexual abuse or exploitation or failure to act, and it presents an imminent risk of serious harm. And this is the federal legislation that guides state legislation on what is child abuse and neglect, because it is by state definition and, and concern. Um, and so this is kind of like overall federal. Uh, and then from there, we know child welfare is managed at a state level. And typically it involves not only child investigations, so child protection investigations, but also um, child-centered resources. And we'll talk a little bit about that, foster care, and then adoption. So those are kind of the four main components. So when a child has been identified as potentially been exposed to some type of abuse or neglect, the child welfare system within the state will then screen whether that child is, um, whether it meets the criteria for that state's definition of abuse and neglect, and then it moves on to the investigation side, and then subsequently if any resources are needed or foster care is needed. So that's kind of the child welfare, but a lot, I'm breezing through it because a lot of you probably already have a really good sense of that. So just a little bit about some of the things we know about child welfare. So for the most part, child welfare is really meant to help support and protect children and families. Um, however, we recognize, I recognize that there's a lot of challenges with the child welfare system. Um, and so I don't wanna discount or make it sound um, like beautiful, wonderful thing. There's a lot of wonderful people working in child welfare, but we also recognize um, it is a broken system at times. And, uh, but the, the ultimate goal is to protect children, keep children safe and help children and families um, provide optimal support and care for children. And with that in mind, for the most part, about 82%, so over 80% of children do remain in the home after an investigation. So really, you know, ideally the, the goal is that we can identify needs and um, keep children within their homes and, and then provide resources as needed to those families, um, parenting support maybe, or mental health services, uh, substance use recovery services, different things like that. So we can really keep that family unit together while also providing the support that that family needs in order to provide optimal care for the child. Now, when a child does have to be removed from the home, um, oftentimes, that you know typically re, um, involves reunification later. So the goal is really to try to get that child back to their birth family, we know how important family families are and family units are. And so to the extent that it's possible, the goal is always to reunify. Um, and in fact, 60% of, of children do reunify with their 
family over time. However, um, you know, there is a, about 20% of, of children that are then adopted foster care, so weren't able to reunify, and then another 20% that either age out or are um, there other reasons, um, such as running away or things like that. So about 60% end up reunifying. Now, by far, the, the children that are removed at the highest rate are children that are one year or younger. And if you think about it, it primarily has to do to the, the dependency of that infant on the caregiver and the demands uh, of that infant. Um, so for the most part, we know that children under the age of one are more likely to be placed in foster care compared to old children who may be identified or investigated for, for a concern. But of those infants that are um, removed from the home, about 40% are reunified within five years. Now, that's not a great number, but I do think it still speaks to the, the goal of child welfare to really try to keep families together. Um, now, in practice, I recognize that that's doesn't always, that's not always the case. And there's certainly individual experiences um, that prevent that from happening. And, and like I mentioned, you know, child welfare isn't perfect. So this is kind of the part of my talk that feels negative. So I just preface that and want to warn you, but that's the importance of, of having this uh, Project ECHO series is to identify the disparities that exist, because when we can shed light on them, we can work together and with our communities to try to reduce the disparities and the discrepancies that exist. So right now in child welfare, historically, there are racial dis, uh, disparities and discrepancies within child welfare. And this is at every stage of child welfare. So we know from our research that black and indigenous children are reported to CPS at higher rates. They're also substantiated at higher rates. So we know that black children are 1.6 times more likely than a white counterpart to be substantiated for child abuse. So that's when an investigation has been occur has been decided to proceed. And then through the investigation, they, they found um, evidence that abuse or the neglect occurred. So our, our black children are being found to be substantiated at a higher rate. And then uh, they're also two times more likely to be uh, placed in foster care. So again, like at each decision point, more likely to be investigated, more likely to be substantiated, and then more likely to be placed in foster care than um, their white peers. Um, this is the same trend for our um, American Indian Indigenous uh, children. 2.5 times more likely to be substantiated, 2.9 times more likely to be placed in foster care. We also know that there's discrepancies with access to care for these children. So our BIPOC families are less likely to receive in-home services and mental health services. And there's lower efforts to retain those children within the home, which is consistent with the, with the numbers that we're seeing, right? That there are less efforts to kind of use those resources to keep children in the home um, or to use those mental health services. Um, and there's you know, so many different reasons we could hypothesize for why this is happening. Certainly we can't discount the systemic racism, the structural racism that exists within our country uh, that are playing significant roles in that. And that includes in the communities act Poverty and access to economic support um, playing a significant role. Um, we also can't ignore uh, systemic and structural bias that um, racism that that exists within um, some of our, our workers that are making these decisions. So that is certainly part of part of a larger picture. But again, I think shedding light on this is, is particularly important. Now, Unfortunately, this also leads to discrepancies in not only healthcare, but also um, mental health resources and mental health care. So we know that there is differences in access to uh, mental health resources for our BIPOC families. Unfortunately, this is also problematic for our youngest 
children. So our young preschool, infancy and preschool age children. So only 13% of children between the ages of two and five are actually receiving the mental health services that they need um, for these for kiddos and in, in child welfare. Um, so there's a lot more we can do. We know that mental health service youth disparities exist for our black and brown children. And so you know, one of the things that is important to note is that child welfare does provide this access to resources. However, if we're not dividing up those resources equitably, you know, that's particularly problematic. And it's problematic for a lot of different reasons um, and have lifelong consequences. The other thing to really note about foster care and, and mental health services, and again, this is negative. So I like, I, I warned y'all for, uh, for this part of the presentation, but I promise we're gonna have an uphill positivity coming up real soon. Um, but you know, one of the important parts about foster care and is that um, they, the goal was always and is always to protect children and to really try to ameliorate any types of, of negative effects from that maltreatment or abuse that they've experienced. Um, however, unfortunately, what we know is that children in foster care have higher rates of mental health disorders as well as higher rates of mental health use. So I'm gonna orient you to this table right here. Um, this, column, if I can bring my mouse over, if you can see it, this column is foster care versus um, the comparison sample non-foster care. So you see how these are single digits versus double digits over here. So we're seeing higher rates of mental health disorders, higher rates of medication. Overall, kids in foster care are getting more access to mental health services than the general population. Um, and partially it's due to being involved in, in having more access from providers and more people involved in their life. Um, partially it's due to higher rates of these, of these um, concerns. Um, but it's unclear why. Why if, if the, the ultimate goal of foster care is to protect children, why do we have higher rates of mental health? You know, consistently throughout the research, there is um, mixed reviews on, on how beneficial, on a me from a mental health perspective, how beneficial foster care is. Um, some, you know, some of that can be due to the instability of foster care, the uncertainty of foster care, um, the number of caregiver disruptions. Um, you know, one of the things that's Consistent through the research is that we know that more caregiver disruptions, so more placement moves for kids, definitely is worse for mental health outcomes. So that is one consistency. It's also possible that the children who are in foster care are out of home placements, that their mental health or mental health present presenting concerns are so so much higher because of the abuse that they experience. So because they, their history of adversity, abuse and neglect rose to a level that required them to be removed from the home, that in of itself could be a contributing factor for their higher uh, mental health service or mental health concerns. Uh, but we also recognize that given the discrepancies within child welfare that it doesn't always have to do with the level of abuse given that we know that our uh, black children are being placed and substantiated for abuse and being placed in foster care uh, at higher rates than our white children. So um, it's not ideal, but uh, there are things we can do. But before we get to that, it's important to understand a little bit about why. Why are we seeing such um, challenging symptoms for some of these kiddos? And, and a lot of this has to do with um, the consequences of early adversity. So, you know, given that this talk is, is and this ECHO series is really about um, infant mental health and maternal and infant mental health, I think it's important to really focus on how our brain functions at early stages. Now, our brains are always developing, they're always changing, they're always learning um, and adapting over our lifespan. But we know by far the most changes in our brains and our brain architecture occurs in the first three years of life. 
During this time, our brains are particularly vulnerable to either negative or positive experiences that the infant has, is encountering in their everyday life. And so for infants that are in a really warm, ad adaptive, ad safe environments, um, they have opportunities to develop really important neural pathways that are supportive of their long-term adjustments over time. But unfortunately for kiddos that are in more toxic stress environments, that early deprivation, um, severe neglect or abuse, or they're you know, in these really scary environments or they're in environments where their, their caregivers aren't responsive, we know that that can impact the pruning of different neurons within their brain to prevent them from developing more adaptive neural pathways that can have long-term implications for their neurodevelopment. It also impacts many of their stress response systems. Early adversity can impact uh, those stress response systems uh, as well as different areas of the brain. Um, so we know from research that there hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access, which is that like stress response system. That's the cortisol that gets released when you're in a really scary situation. That system can be impaired by early adversity in those first few years of life. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, more about that stress response system in the next slide. But we also know that there's specific areas of the brain um, that are underdeveloped um, and actually shrink in size when you're exposed to adversity. So one area in particular is your amygdala. And that's a, uh, that part of your brain is important for emotions and emotion processing and emotion regulation. Um, and so those early experiences are scary or not adaptive or not supportive. Um, you're gonna see challenges long-term with emotion regulation skills because that, that area of the brain that processes emotions is impaired. We also know that the hippocampus gets affected by early adversity. So that part of your brain is um, important for learning and memory, working memory skills, things like that. So that means that for kids with early adversity exposure, they're gonna, they might have a harder time in school. They might have a harder time learning different concepts or have harder time with memory. Um, and so it's important to take that into account um, in the long run for, for children. And then finally, the other part of your brain is the prefrontal cortex that we know is impacted by early adversity, um, both prenatal exposure as well as postnatal um, adversity. And so that's kind of the front of your brain um, that's responsible for those executive functioning skills. Now they don't start to come online um, till I would say late early childhood, middle childhood into adolescence, they're not fully developed. That part of your brain isn't developed till mid uh, adulthood. So like 25, um, but it can still be impacted by that early experiences um, that the child has, has been exposed to. And so these, the, the areas of, of this part of the brain really has to do with like your impulse control. Like how can you prevent yourself from like running into the middle of the street? Um, it has to do with your planning and problem solving, those higher order cognitive functions, um, working memory. So how can you take in information and use that um, and either consolidate it to our long-term memory in our hippocampus or hold that in our brain, use it and problem solve with it to move forward. So these are the areas of the brain that are, are typically um, impacted by that early adversity. And when we think about this uh, critical period of time in early childhood, it's important to talk about toxic stress because um, for the most part, our, our bodies are designed to protect us. So our bodies are designed to have stress response system uh, the APA or the um, autonomic nervous system that alerts us to the fears in our environment. So if we're in the woods and we see a bear, we need our stress response system to come on. We need it to allow us to use that fight or flight response because that's what's gonna keep us safe. That's what's gonna help our survival. However, when we're thinking about our young children and in infancy and, and maternal and infant care, What's 
really important is that the infant uses that stress response system to help their caregiver know that they need their basic needs met. So for example, an infant wakes up from a nap and is uncomfortable, so they start to cry. Their stress response system is ignited and their communication is through crying. And the caregiver, the, the mom or the dad or whoever's in that, in that um, home, hears that crying and responds to the need. They come in and they change the baby's diaper. They may give them a bottle. They may do different things to help their child re-regulate. And that will uh, disable or, or, or down-regulate their stress response system, which is exactly what we want to see, right? That's their way of communicating. For kiddos that are in this red zone, this toxic stress um, environments where it's, again, that deprivation, that severe neglect and abuse, for these kiddos, they don't have that protective caregiver there to, to help address that stress response. The every effort for them to communicate by crying and whining and, and screaming isn't being met. They're not, a, the caregiver in their environment isn't meeting those basic needs. And so their stress response system that is continuing to be activated. And this prolonged activation can have long-term impact because it doesn't turn off normally. And through this pattern of, of not having their needs met, their basic needs met, their, the child learns to stop communicating. The child learns to, to try to rely on themselves because they're not getting their needs met by that caregiver. So their activation system, their stress response system is going to be impaired such that they're going to have more, op it's going to be easier to activate that stress response system. And they're going to internally learn unconsciously because they're infants, but they're going to internally learn that my needs are not getting met by, by this caregiver. And therefore I need to rely on myself in those moments. And this can be so ch uh, challenging and harmful for our brains and our be behaviors over time. Um, and it can really change the biology of how our brains function and our stress response system. So these early periods of life are super critical. But here's the good part. So this is the like up positive, like upwards, upward part of the talk, right? Like we got through the negative stuff and the things that are challenging and the consequences. So let's, let's talk about, okay, so this is hard. And some of these things are really challenging. So what do we do? The main thing we know is that having a protective caregiving child relationship, maternal infant relationship is going to be the best buffer for addressing and, and managing the re responses and consequences from this early adversity, both prenatally and postnatally. And this relationship, caregiver child relationship can, is the foundation for mental health. If we do not, that's how children's brains develop. I hope you understood that from the last one. Children's brains develop in the context of relationships and through supportive relationships, we can help that child's regulation system, stress response system, be more adaptive, be more typical, um, that can help them neurodevelopmentally long-term. And so it can really buffer any of those prenatal experiences, that prenatal exposure and or postnatal exposure, that abuse or that, that neglect. And, and so through fostering these relationships, this is gonna be the foundation. So what, for example, what we would expect for a, a secure parent-child attachment relationship um, is that the child learns that the parent is there in proximity, so closeness, as well as responsivity. So for example, let's say that the child is exploring their world. They're maybe playing at home, running down the hallway. Maybe they're at a park or walking on the sidewalk in there. They're running ahead and the child falls and scrapes their knee. So a supportive relationship, child relationship involves the parent recognizing that the child fell going to the child and supporting them or the child coming to the parent, and again, the parent supporting them and organizing that child's world. So helping that child recognize like, that was really scary. This is a big experience. I need help. And then being there and supporting them through that. 
So they're there in proximity, they're, avail they're right there and available. And then they're responding to that child's needs. Because for the child, you know, let's say they're two or something, they fall and they skin their knee. And to them, all they feel is uncomfortableness. Like that was, I don't know what this is, but this is really big and this feels like a lot. And I'm in pain, but I don't know that it's pain. It's just like this big emotion. And the parents then come in and they're there to support them through that and organize how they may be feeling. So the, they might come to them and say, oh, wow, buddy, you fell on your knee. That looks like it hurt. You might be, you might be in a lot of pain. Hey, that was, that might've been a little bit scary. I'm here though. Do you need a hug? Can I give you a kiss? Oh, it looks like we might need a band-aid. Let's go wash that off and get a band-aid. So the child is then learning about their world and making sense of their world and able to really regulate uh, themselves in the context of that of that caregiver. So with that caregiver support, you might see the child go from like instant screaming and tears to like whimpering, like, oh yeah, that hurt. And then, and then within a few minutes, you know, you might see them back to exploring again. And through that caregiver support, they're able to really say, you know, that was really scary and big. Are you, are you ready to play? Oh, not ready to play yet. Let's read a book or something like that. And then we can get back into it. Um, and you can go back and explore. And within a few minutes, you know, you'll typically see a child like get back up and start running again on the sidewalk or get back up and start playing again. Um, and so that's an example of how um, a attachment within the caregiver child relationship can be really supportive and help that child make sense of their world and then explore their world again. And so how do we foster this? So it's not just a parent's present, right? There's some things we need to do. We need to help the parents um, recognize how to co-regulate with their child, that it's, it's, um, it involves really three different domains. And this first one is this provide a warm and responsive relationship. And I want to be super clear. I'm not saying it should be a permissive, like parenting style relationship where they just are able to just run and explore and um, they kind of rule the house and parents kind of let them do whatever. No, it's warm with boundaries, right? Like I'm going to respond to you warmly and I'm going to be there and present for you but I'm still the adult here and I know what's safe and I'm gonna keep you safe because I'm gonna have rules and boundaries, right? Um, but I'm gonna have this warm, loving approach. And then there's structuring the environment. And that's kind of that like strong hands, like we are going to be there together and, and I'm gonna be warm and supportive, but these, this, this is the, the rules of the house and I'm gonna make sure the structure of the home is safe. So we have rules, boundaries, I'm consistent um, and, I'm gonna also keep the environment safe. I'm gonna make sure that you don't have scary people in your environment. I'm gonna make sure that you don't have access to um, things that might harm you, maybe like alcohol or drugs available, things like that. Like I'm gonna structure that environment so that you're safe to explore in this environment. And then one of the most important domains of, of the parent-child relationship and helping the child co-regulate is through teaching. So that was that example I used when the child fell. It's like you're teaching and coaching self-regulation skills to the child just by, and, and oftentimes parents don't even realize they're doing this. They're helping them make sense of the world and they're helping them understand what their big feelings are and how to manage those big feelings and make sense of them. But this looks different at, at different stages, right? So in infancy, it's, basic needs. I'm going to make, I'm going to meet your basic needs and make sure you have food and that you're changed and that you're not in pain. And then as we move into toddlerhood, it's, I'm going to, you know, keep an eye on you and make sure that you're staying safe, but you're exploring the world. And when big things happen and you get scared, I'm going to be there to help you understand and, and put labels to those feelings. And then as we move into preschool age and middle middle childhood age, that elementary school age, we're going to start seeing a change in what this co-regulation looks like because we've had this foundation of this parent-child relationship. And then we have this, this installation of, of cognitive skills and different regulation skills starting to develop in, in children. And 
And so then it becomes a little bit more of a collaborative approach, but it has to start with this foundation, this foundation of a responsive and a caregiver that's present and able to be there. Um, and then that helps them regulate in the moment. And then we can move to our self-regulation. So it's this like, once we have built the, the foundation, then we can build, that's how our brain works and how, how our regulation works is it builds layer on layer on layer. And that co-regulation goes from, I'm gonna be here and present and, and support you in, in organizing how you might be feeling to now I'm gonna be available, but you're gonna be out in the world and you're gonna self, start self-regulating when you're with your friends or when you're at school. And when big things happen, like you got in a fight with a friend and you come home, I'm going to help you navigate those challenging feelings of like jealousy and, and uh, frustration or, or anger, uh, things like that. But in the, for the most part, you're going to start learning through all of the support I've provided earlier and through um, you kind of developing your own skills cognitively and executive function wise, your own skills so that the child can then manage their own thoughts and their own feelings. Um, and they can start using those, those actions and behaviors in really goal-oriented ways across their different environments. And really the self-regulation is built through these relationships. And as I mentioned before, for kiddos that have been exposed to this toxic stress environment where they don't have that foundation, they don't have that positive caregiver child relationship, we don't have the foundation or the structure to build on. So they jump straight to self-regulation. And we know what that, you know, how challenging that can be if they don't actually have the skills and know how to self-regulate. So they rely on themselves, but you see that they're more prone to frustration, more prone to anger. And that's kind of what we see with our case example I mentioned earlier, is that Dylan didn't have that foundation of that positive caregiver child relationship. So he had to learn to rely on himself. And that's now leading to our current situation at two years old, where his presenting concerns are low frustration tolerance, aggression towards others, and aggression towards self. Because he's relying on himself, but not actually learned any of the self-regulation skills that he needs. And because he didn't have that stage of co-regulation. So what do we do for kids in foster care? There's, there's a few different things. Um, oh, and I wanted to share this before I get into that, a few different things for kids in foster care. But before I get into that, I wanted to also share, um, here's just a few like quick things that can help build self-regulation skills. It's many of the different types of um, coping strategies you would learn through therapies and things like that, like individual therapy. I don't know if it's helpful to like, take a screenshot of this or take a picture of this. So I'm not gonna go through all of these exhaustively. We just don't have time for that. But uh, I just wanna share, you know, these are a few different like writing things in a journal, deep breathing, scheduling breaks, things like that. Um, if you want my slides, I'll have my email at the end of the presentation and you can just email me. I'm happy to share my slides with you too. Um, but these are a few things that you can help use once you have that good caregiver child relationship, that co-regulation. And we're trying to, you know, in middle childhood and things like that, we're trying to work on self-regulation. These are a few strategies to help, to help work towards that. Um, and how, so what do we do for these those in foster care that have that caregiver disruption or didn't have that early experience of a warm, positive, responsive caregiver, you know, one of the most important things is we really need placement stability. So for, for these kiddos, we need someone, a primary caregiver in their life that can, that can be that attachment figure for them and foster that caregiver child relationship so that they learn how to learn how to navigate this world and they can start regulating with that caregiver in order to then develop those self-regulation skills. But it really is, they have to have a, you know, placement stability for this to be even possible. We also have really excellent evidence-based interventions, um, assessments and interventions for um, recognizing challenges 
that the child may have be experiencing those consequences, but then also interventions to address that. Like once we know what, what the concern is, how do we foster that caregiver child relationship if it's new or if it's been broken due to adversities or abuse that the child experienced? Like how do we help that parent and child work together to, to really foster that relationship? Um, how do we help the child process the trauma and the parent be that supportive caregiver for them? And then so many needs for preventative efforts to prevent the adversity and, and begin with. Those community efforts that Nicole had mentioned earlier, we need community-based efforts and supports from both a federal and a state level, but also just community-based resources and supports to help our families so that we can prevent adversity from happening to begin with, or if it has to prevent future adversities from, from, from um, occurring. So with the last couple of seconds, minutes, I just wanted to go through our case example and just kind of give you a sense of kind of what happened with Dylan, where we go from there. Um, so this is again kind of back, background information. So I won't reiterate it, but just as a reminder, he's a two-year-old male, biracial male with prenatal and postnatal risk factors um, and presents with impulse control, low frustration tolerance, aggression towards others and self, and then some developmental delays. So this was his trajectory. So this lighter blue arrow represents some of that prenatal exposure. So that we know from research, prenatal um, drug and alcohol exposure does have an impact on brain development um, and late and functioning later in life. So we can't discount that that is part of his history. And then he was born in June, 2019, and he lived with his birth family uh, for 17 months. Again, I, I re reiterated on the slide, just kind of some of those um, risk factors that occurred during his uh, first period of life, so during that birth family. And then he was placed in foster care in November, 2020. Um, and when he was first placed in foster care, um, he was placed with a kinship provider, it was his aunt, but he was placed without his brothers. Um, and this was for a number of reasons. Um, due to dynamics within that birth family, there was a lot of challenges between the brothers. One, because all of them had um, different experiences of abuse and neglect. Um, and so just all three of them together was just overwhelming for, for one family. Um, but also because um, of how birth parents had interacted differently with the children, um, there was a lot of incidents of the middle child, the middle brother, um, getting upset at anger, the younger brother and kind of physically attacking him. Um, and then they had decided um, permanency was going to be part of this child's history. Um, and we, we couldn't, um, reunification is always on the table for this kiddo, um, but he is going to, um, they had decided that they were going to place the, the boys together with their other paternal aunt and uncle. And so they were kind of transitioning to living with paternal aunt and uncle. And then finally, um, they, and so that's kind of where we ended this. And then they came to our clinic for an evaluation after being in um, their kinship provider for a year. And so these are the, this is the evaluation that we did. So we had in-person observations, we did in-home observations. Um, we used the strange situation protocol um, to induce a little bit of a stressor for the child. We did some developmental testing and um, interestingly, he was in the average range for cognitive functioning as well as motor functioning um, for one year post uh, being in foster care. We had some questionnaire data and he was elevated for externalizing behaviors. Um, and so we ended up you know, seeing him with oops, um, other trauma, stress, deprivation disorders. So that's like PTSD, but not meeting full criteria for PTSD. Um, but we know there was some stress response there and then a neurodevelopmental disorder. And so for him, um, we ended up recommending continuing therapy. We had recommended therapy earlier um, just for the older boys and they had gotten that started and they were already seeing some really good benefits from that. So it was some in-home intensive treatment for kids in foster care. Um, and then we also recommended another neuropsychology evaluation prior to kindergarten, given the gains that we had already seen um, and some of the therapy that they're doing. It's important given his um, history of adversity 
that we get a sense of how his brain works optimally. Um, so we recommended another neuropsychology evaluation, this longitudinal approach prior to kindergarten. Um, so that's a little bit about Dylan and um, some of the evaluation that we did and, and kind of where his story went. Um, I have a little bit more about that, but I know in, just because of the timing, I wanna make sure we have opportunity for questions. Um, and here's my contact information as well. Does anyone have any questions for me? And I'll let Zora can help you facilitate that, or yeah. I believe people could actually unmike because of the chat feature not working. Yeah, for sure. If, if you would like to unmute or, um, you know, if you feel more comfortable writing something in the chat or the Q&A, I can read it off um, for Katie. Thanks again, Katie, for that presentation. Um, just to get us started, I did have a question that came up for myself, so I can, I can ask you that. Um, so are there any resources that you suggest for parents um, or caregivers who have ACEs themselves? So like whether that's foster parents or kinship caregivers, I just know that in the work that I've done, I've kind of seen that it's um, oftentimes like the, the caregivers have their own ACEs and traumas that they're dealing with. And then like with their kids, um, navigating how to, to parent and, and things like that with that can sometimes be difficult. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really important to talk about because because of the prevalence of, of adverse experiences, most of us in day-to-day -day life have some ACEs that we've experienced. Um, and then certainly for a lot of the family that we're working with, you know, they might have challenges themselves. Um, and so, you know, it really depends on the level of impairment for their, for the for the individual. So if the that person is finding that um their history, their adversity exposure, um, whether it's pre-childhood abuse or neglect, if that's um, you know still really playing a role, especially in how they're parenting their children, or it's bringing up. And what we find too for parents is that they might have experienced some type of like really challenging, horrific trauma or abuse during a period of time, like maybe during like early childhood, they, they experienced a lot of trauma. So then they're parenting their child through the same period of time. And so that's when things are coming up. So maybe infancy, nothing necessarily came up, but all of a sudden my kid's three and all of these things are coming up and it's harder to parent my three-year-old. And then I recognize that, gosh, that's when that sexual abuse thing happened at three. Like maybe that's what's playing a role. And so one of the things that is really important um, is for them to get the get their own uh, individual therapy to really work through that past trauma um, with someone who has a lens of how this could be reflecting on on how they're parenting their own children. Um, and so, one really great evidence based intervention is child parent psychotherapy, um, and that is definitely a, it's meant for the child's development, but it helps the parent work through kind of what am I bringing. The table. We're all human, we don't exist within a vacuum. And so my history and the way I was parented is going to impact how I parent my child. And that means that if I experience some, some challenges during childhood, that could be a part of my history and that could be playing a role. Um, so parent-child psychotherapy is one. And then also, like I said, individual therapy to really address their own experiences and traumas that they um, um, have had or other types of, of challenges. You know, some, fam some parents may not have a ton of um, ACEs per se, but they might have this genetic predisposition for anxiety. So they're just like really nervous and overly anxious and it's impacting how they're parenting. You know, even individual therapy to work on strategies for anxiety can, can really help them individually and then help them parent. So yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, that intergenerational experiences is huge. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for answering that. Um, yeah. Did anybody want to unmute or share any questions they may have? I think we have time for maybe one more. No, give it just a second. 
And if anyone wants to, I have my email address on here. If anyone wants to email me afterwards um, for slides or like wants to ask a question individually, happy to chat over email or at a different time if that's easier. Um, I have another question that I could ask, um, Katie. Yeah, please. Um, so you kind of talked about this, but are there any early screenings um, for infants that you suggest um, if like, you know, you're aware of ACEs um, going mm -hmm. on and things like that? I know you kind of mentioned that in your last slide, but um, could you tell us more about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so a couple of things that are coming to mind as you say that. So early screenings could look differently. So there's questionnaires. Um, so like the baby pediatric symptom, that's like a zero to 18 months. That's like a questionnaire, parent questionnaire that you could as an agency or providers have your families fill out for children zero to 18 months. There's older ones I can give you if, if you, um, you know, want older age ones, but that's like a 15 item questionnaire as a provider that you could share with families. And if they are elevated on, on different, there's like, um, I think it's like temperament and like impulse. I forget what it, what all of the scales are, but it's 15 items. It's really easy. I can share it with you. Um, that could be a resource you could use to like quick screen families, um, to see if there's concerns. And then no, of course you have to think like, what do we do with that, right? Like, what do we do once we know that there's concerns? Um, and if there is there's a few community resources, um, I shamelessly am gonna plug the Birth to Three Clinic at the University of Minnesota. Um, we, we try to get families in within just like a, a month or two. Um, we try not to have a wait list or anything um, because children during zero to three change so quickly in just a month or two. And so we can get kids in pretty quickly quickly. Um, and that's a full, um, and it, it can be, it's so flexible with us. So we'll, we'll meet you, um, virtually for an hour with that family. Um, and then depending on the needs, we might have you come in for an in-person and do a full diagnostic assessment. We might have you just do more of a consultation with, with me or one of our other psychologists, um, and just like check in. And then if we feel like, you know, other community resources or therapy would be helpful. We have a bunch of um, community uh, partners that we would provide to the family for like ongoing therapeutic support. Um, so for example, if you were to give that baby pediatric checklist, they elevated high, then you can say, hey, here's the birth to three clinic, come, come connect with us. There's other community resources in the area um, that also provide um, evaluations for birth to three. Um, specifically, you can look for the diagnostic classification, um, DC zero to five, any community provider that says that they offer DC zero to five evaluations, basically do what we do. So you don't have to feel obligated to come to the university of Minnesota. Like there's other Washburn, Frazier, the places like that, like they're doing, um, in Lee Carlson up in the Northern suburbs. Um, I have a, a bunch of other places if they're, you're like in the Northern Minnesota and things like that, if you need to know where they provide evaluations for that. But those are a couple of things that pop to my head of like, how do we green kiddos that we know have maybe these adversities, but we don't know if like compared to other kids their age, are they really elevated or is this just right. typical baby behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so those are a couple of things that, you know, spring to mind. So thank you. And where's the birth to three clinic located? So we're in the Mayazonic Institute for the Developing Brain. It's right off of East River Road on the East Bank um, of the University of Minnesota. For those of you who've been in the Twin Cities area, it's the old Shriner Hospital. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but it was converted to the new Brain Institute for the U of M. And it's a it's like a specialty clinic. They have um, neurodevelopmental, neuropsych testing there. Um, autism assessments are through there. Um, and then our birth to three clinic is um, located there as well. Yeah. Thanks, Katie. Yeah. Um, I've not seen any other questions. So I think I'm, I know we're kind of at time. So I'll pass it back to, to Nicole. I'd just like to thank you, Zora, for robust um, questions um, that I think are helpful to everyone here. And thank you, Katie, for your graciousness of sharing your information, but also providing us with a really uh, powerful presentation, but with 
great case study to follow and analyze. I, I just really appreciate, again, um, the multidisciplinary approach that you have used in this talk. Thank you everyone from attending. I did try to put in the chat the next in our series, um, but it did not work. Um, but please remember the Wayside um, link. The landing page has all our upcoming events that will be happening. And the next one will be with Stephanie Crawford from Massachusetts. And she will be talking about pregnancy after loss isn't always rainbows and sunshine. Um, she is an educator, but she also has a very small nonprofit group that really started to uh, figure out how can we partner with hospitals and clinics in Massachusetts to serve um, women like herself who have suffered a loss. Um, so out of the network not being present in Massachusetts, she decided to step in and provide some of those services. So we'll learn from her. But thank you again, Katie, and thank you everyone for attending today. And we will get the video uploaded within the next week or two, certificates in a survey. So have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you all.